Hi, today we're going to talk about expectations. That's a pretty boring sentence, isn't it? Expectations are like the Federal Reserve of our conscious inner life. They're dull and stale and we'd rather not think about them, but they're enormously influential. Expectations set interest rates and they let the past shape the present as we guess the future. Like the Fed guides the banks and the whole economy, expectations guide our interactions with other people, with the world, and with ourselves. And similar to what we've seen in the 21st century with the Fed's labyrinthine grip on the economy post-recessions, expectations can be pretty hard to shake once they come into effect. As boring as expectations may be to focus on, once you start to look for them, you really start to see them everywhere. What are the Ten Commandments and the Bill of Rights except expectations that are considered justifiable, reasonable, necessary, and compulsory? What are laws but official expectations enforced through state power? What are marriage vows but a guarantee that certain expectations are considered reasonable? How do we react when our expectations aren't met? We either change our expectations consciously or unconsciously, or we try to change the world to meet our expectations consciously or unconsciously. People fall in love or break up because of expectations. People make investments or divestments because of expectations. And basically every major and minor life decision is made because of expectations or in line with expectations or in reference to expectations. We always have expectations because we've learned over thousands of generations that we can't afford not to. Our ability to plan is how we've built civilizations, and expectations are directly related to plans. Expectations are basically plans for things we can't control. Yes, of course we need to make plans for things we can't control, because things we can't control influence things we can control, and vice versa. Our expectations need to be active and varied to prepare us for what might happen. But beyond just preparing us, as we'll talk about, expectations actually change how we perceive the world. Before we really get into this, I'll just give you one fun fact. While highly unrealistic expectations might cause us dramatic swings of emotion, it's actually slightly unrealistic expectations that affect our perception of reality more. As one study put it, when expectations are highly inaccurate, they are less likely to bias the contents of perception. But wait, bias perception? How do expectations even exist in enough reality themselves to affect our perception of reality? What are they even? It's not like our expectations are always consciously formed into words in our brain, and if they're not met, then the words get crossed out and we feel pain. That wasn't supposed to rhyme. But yeah, and it's not like we have a list of specific expectations encoded in our DNA, though we do have genetic predispositions, which could kind of be said to be like biophysiological expectations, but I don't know. I'm making this vid because I know that expectations change and affect how we perceive and experience the world and everything from highlights to lowlights. And I think expectations are one of the most important factors in mental health. I'm going to be referencing some studies, and I'm not remotely the person to be giving an overall summary of the current state of research. I'm doing my best unique synthesis, so please understand my limitations here. I hope you enjoy this, and I hope you notice that I'm intentionally trying to lower your expectations. There are different ways we hold expectations, and we'll talk about two of those here reward-based expectations and rule-based expectations. First, let's talk about reward-based expectations. What are they and what do they do? One study describes increased reward expectation improves reaction time and accuracy in the relevant dimension while reducing sensitivity to modulations of stimuli characteristics in the irrelevant dimension. What? The irrelevant dimension is whatever doesn't seem worth our brains expecting a reward from. But where in the brain are we talking about, you might be asking. Regarding specific brain regions, 
This study found that the proximity to reward over successive trials is associated with increased activity of the medial frontal cortex, regardless of the modality of the activity. And reward expectancy enhances coupling in both early visual pathways and within the prefrontal cortex. BT dubs, coupling is ephaptic coupling, ion exchange between cells, a form of communication. The study goes on to say, these distributed changes in task-related cortical networks arise from subjects' representations of future events and likelihood of reward. But reward is not the only basis for expectations, right? So let's talk about rule-based expectations. We expect things not just because they will provide reward, but also just since they follow from what we've experienced before. These expectations exist in different parts of the brain. While the representation of rewards is closely associated with the orbital and medial frontal cortex, the anterior cingulate, and the ventral striatum, in contrast, cognitive set or rule functions are closely associated with the lateral prefrontal cortex. But, of course, reward-based expectations relate and interact with set-based expectations. Or, as one study put it, Prior statistics warp neural representations in the frontal cortex, allowing the mapping of sensory inputs to motor outputs to incorporate prior statistics. The rewards can help us be aware of the rules, and the rules can help us get the rewards. Expectations are obviously very relevant to decision-making, a well-studied subject. One study searched for the neural correlates of decision-making and found evidence that medial prefrontal cortical neurons played a causal role inactivating medial prefrontal cortex before outcome, strengthened learning from the outcome. On the other hand, down deep in the ventral tegmental area, dopamine neurons played a causal role only after the outcome, when they encoded reward prediction errors graded by confidence, influencing subsequent choices. So the inactivation of the medial prefrontal cortex neurons primes us to learn, and then the ventral tegmental area, dopamine pathways, help us learn after we do something and sense the reward value of what changed from the outcome, comparing it to what we expect. To continue, first we have to talk about the corpus callosum. You may or may not already know what the corpus callosum is, but it's a nerve tract that connects the two hemispheres of the brain, and it only exists in placental mammals. It's one of the special things that comes along with being a placental mammal. Okay, wait, hold on. Let me explain briefly what being a placental mammal means so you understand how it relates to our brains being so well-developed. Placental mammals are the animals distinguished by their development of the temporary organ we call the placenta that helps the fetus get metabolites and clear out toxic substances. Placentas are beautifully disgusting organs that help protect us when we are our most vulnerable. And placental mammals have long gestation periods usually, so we get a lot of time to get ready in our safe placentas for this insane world. Placental mammals have specifically designed pelvises for giving birth to babies with big craniums. We also have a few bones that are unique. Placental mammals are in the fossil record dating back to 65 million years ago, which by the way is right after the Cretaceous-Paleogene extinction event that happened 66 million years ago and destroyed three quarters of plants and animals on the planet. And it's very likely placental mammals existed well before the impactor. There are many different kinds of land and marine placental mammals. Humans are in magna order Boreoeutheria, Boreoeutheria, which includes everything from rodents, camels, and deer to porpoises, hippos, and humans. And the placenta is extremely useful as a development, which explains why it's persisted in so many broad walks of life. A well-functioning placenta is critical to the process of giving birth to a human baby with a healthy brain. I think I said the word placenta here more times than I'd ever said it before total. So back to the brain now, with that little bit of perspective into our family tree and how we get birthed. We're going to zoom in on a specific part of the brain and we're going to try to give it a decent introduction. It's called the subgenual anterior cingulate cortex. To give a sense of perspective, the cingulate cortex is situated above the corpus callosum nerve tract we just mentioned, which runs deep down the middle of our brains from front to back. Anterior means in the front, so we're at the front side of the cingulate cortex. Subgenual means underneath the genu. And the genu is the front end of the corpus callosum, which gets the cool word genu because it means knee. And genu is like the knee of the corpus callosum. So in the anterior cingulate cortex, 
under the Genu, there are a few adjacent areas here that are important to our discussion. If you've looked at neuroscience research before, you'll be familiar with the Brodmann's areas, which are the parts of the brain named after anatomist Corbinian Brodmann. Honestly, he had such a cool name, I wouldn't even mind calling them Corbinian areas, or even Corbinian Brodmann areas, but that's just me. Here, we're going to be talking about the Corbinian Brodmann areas 24 and 25 for now. A study last year found that overactivating area 25 in the subgenual anterior cingulate cortex inhibited appetitive anticipatory but not consummatory arousal. Anticipatory arousal is excitement in anticipation of something, and consummatory arousal is enjoyment of something. Anticipatory arousal actually serves in part to help motivate us towards consummatory arousal, but before we get into that, how did they overactivate this area, SGACC25? It's worth explaining. They did it in two ways, both involving glutamate, the most common excitatory neurotransmitter. One, they reduced glutamate reuptake in the synapses between the cells. And two, they increased the release of glutamate into the synapses. So overall, a lot more glutamate exciting the neurotransmitters, getting it going. When they overactivated the monkeys SGACC25s with glutamate, they found the monkeys less aroused by the idea of food. But, as the consummatory arousal part implies, the monkeys still enjoyed the food when they ate it. They just couldn't predict how much they were going to like it. Their expectations were all whack from their SGACC25s being overblown with glutamate. And they couldn't get excited about things and anticipate joy. So it's maybe not surprising that this research also showed that overactivating the SGACC25 reduces the willingness to work for reward. They suppressed their monkey subjects' desire for food and willingness to expend effort, and they did it by inhibiting the monkey's ability to anticipate arousal, all with some glutamate to overactivate the specific area of the brain, the SGACC25. This region has been studied for a while, and it's important not just because blowing it out with glutamate can reduce excitement and motivation to work. In addition to glutamate content, what also matters is the cortical volume, or as I like to call it, the sheer amount of brain. In one study from 1999, depressed people had 48% less cortical volume in their subgenual prefrontal cortexes than non-depressed people. In addition to less volume of brain in this area, depressed people had an abnormal reduction of cerebral blood flow and glucose metabolism. So people who are depressed have less blood flow to this part of the brain, less glucose metabolism in this part of the brain, and less brain in this part of the brain, less cortical volume. And as we all know, depression is marked precisely by an inability to experience anticipatory arousal, thinking and even knowing in your bones that nothing is worth doing. Well, yes, it's all well and good. Depression has neural aspects, obviously. Why am I going on about this? We know how motivation uses expectation of some kind of reward, and the brain is the whole shebang running that process. And am I trying to say that neuron-level stuff is causing depression and lack of arousal? Or am I just saying that it's associated with it. Well, and that's the interesting part. The causation goes both ways. Our expectations about rules and patterns, as well as our expectations about rewards and losses, are all learned through firsthand experience and created because of our experience in the world. But it also can't be denied that our expectations indirectly but absolutely have impacts on the world. They have impacts because the expected thing always does or does not happen and is or is not to some degree similar or different from what our expectations were. And those differences cause feelings. If you want an example of expectations affecting the world, think about the folks who expect the rapture and judgment day to come at some point in the near future. Do you think that affects how they act in the world? decisions that they make? Some researchers have argued that the high number of people in the U.S. who believe in a coming judgment day is a cause of the resistance in the U.S. to taking action to slow anthropogenic climate change. Huh. Who would have thought that expecting the world to end soon would make people less motivated to stop harming it through exploiting its resources? Unreasonable expectations can set ineffective public policy in many ways. In some of my previous social work experience, I worked with clients who were unable to get a job for months because they were recovering from years of drug addiction. Many people, for reasons related to disabilities, inabilities, or mental health struggles, can't hold a job for some period of their life, and it does no good to deny them necessities like food and shelter. 
Yet some conservative politicians regularly stand on a platform of making it as hard as possible for people to get unemployment benefits, food stamps, or housing if they're not working. I think this reveals some interesting expectations about human behavior. Just a few weeks ago, the US president signed a few executive orders, uh, it was on August 8th, and argued that giving people $600 a week would disincentivize people from working. But his $400 a week idea was perfect to not disincentivize them. Now, disincentivizing something is pretty similar to lowering the anticipatory arousal of it. So this is the US president speaking on an expectation widely shared by conservative politicians, and it's that giving people things disincentivizes them. And call me biased, but I believe that the government can and should fulfill the role of providing for the welfare of people. Another expectation that affects a lot of people is the expectation that private industry is always more competitive and effective than the public sector. While this is certainly true much of the time, it's not a consistent rule and exceptions are worth noting. For example, as one researcher puts it, the excessive costs of privately mediated healthcare in the USA and their effects on industrial relations may constitute a competitive disadvantage avoided by those countries relying on lower cost public provision. In general, we need to be aware of our expectations when they're causing harm to the world around us by dictating our harmful actions or harmful neglect of actions on a large scale, on a small scale, wherever our expectations shape things in ways we don't want them to. But before we finish today's episode, let's zoom back in on the smaller scale of how expectations directly impact our perception of reality. There was a breakthrough study in 1962 by Hubel and Weasel, <laughs> there's no way I'm saying that correctly, that looked at the neurons in the visual cortex, the brain cells that control how we see. Without getting into math that I don't understand, they identified what they call simple cells that respond to light and movement of light, and what they called complex cells, which didn't respond simply to light and movement, but responded to certain kinds of light and certain properties of movement. The complex visual neurons essentially prefer certain phenomena, and some are more picky than others. Much research has been done building off of this landmark study, but what I want to focus on is a study from last year when some folks hooked macaws up to, wait, that's how you say that, right? focus on is some research from last year where some folks hooked macaques up to complicated computers. I think it's pronounced macaques. Macaques? I don't know. I thought it was macaw until I looked it up, but I think it's macaques. Anyways, these beautiful monkeys, which have the kind of ugly name of macaque, were hooked up to complicated computers and they were sat with their eyes aimed at a screen and shown 2,550 images some of which kept coming up if they were grabby enough, which the computers calculated by scanning the monkeys' brains as they looked at the screens. But it wasn't just images being shown from a database. There was partly that, and then there were images that were created by morphing the images that were already presented and recombining them for the monkeys to grab the monkeys' attention even more. What the monkeys looked at influenced what came up next, so the monkey's expectation of visual stimuli was algorithmically blending with the stimuli they were getting and they were basically creating, in a sense, the next images that they would see. The computers started from a base of 1.4 million photos and then did all that live combination while the monkeys were looking at the images, feeding the neural network. A perfect example of simultaneous top-down and bottom-up processing. The studies aimed to test the monkey's inferior temporal cortex neurons firing rates and the ways that visual neurons prefer certain visual stimuli. And guess what visual stimuli monkeys like? Monkeys. They like monkeys. Here's what two separate monkeys ended up with as each of their preferred visual stimuli, the final photos that were grabbing them the most. One on the left, one on the right. Kind of looks like two monkeys, eh? Two monkeys painted by Monkey Picasso? This is what the monkeys manifested from the depths of the deep generative neural network. The researchers arranged neatly the 2,550 images shown to one monkey, with the more stimulating ones in one corner and the less stimulating ones in the other. And just a casual glance at the chart of images 
gives one the clear sense that the stimulating corner is full of monkey-like shapes and the non-stimulating one isn't. For example, a chessboard image is the eighth least activating image to a macaque, the uncultured swine, along with a bench, a guitar, binoculars, a belt, and a few other clearly non-monkey friendly things that comprise the bottom 10 for this one monkey's degree of activation. These things don't turn the monkeys on because they don't meet either reward-based expectations or rule-based expectations. The monkeys don't enjoy playing chess and never have. The point is though that Quote, if these evolved images are telling us something important about the tuning properties of inferior temporal neurons, then we should be able to use them to predict neurons' responses to novel images. The researchers go on to explain, quote, the unrealistic nature of our evolved images, plus the fact that these images were more effective than most or all of the images in an extensive natural image database, suggests that these images might lie somewhere on tuning axes that extend beyond anything the animal would normally encounter. Tuning axes? The heck does that mean? These monkey plus algorithm created images show what the monkeys really seek and what really lights them up. But they're images that obviously don't exist in the natural world. The images weren't exactly monkeys, they were just approximations of monkeys. It makes me wonder about our expectations on a broader level than just the visual. Do we have expectations that can't be met by anything in the natural world too? Do we get more lit up by something we've created than by something that already exists? Do we get confused trying to attain something that will really get our tuning axes lit up? One time when I was going through the breakup of a significant romantic relationship, I took some time and I wrote down what I thought the traits were that I was looking for in a romantic partner, just out of curiosity. There were traits that seemed to directly contradict each other, like serious and lighthearted or energetic and calm. And while I know that these traits don't actually contradict each other and that they exist on a spectrum and many people totally have both traits, it did make me think about whether on a larger level I may have had unreasonable expectations of love, of a relationship, or of what one other person can be for me. In love, we often find our expectations to be the most powerful and confusing, because it's where we have the strongest feelings. Do you expect your partner to make you happy, like all the time? Do you expect them to meet your needs, like all the time? Do you expect them to be happy all the time? Do you expect your partner to talk about their feelings with you more, or less? But outside of love, we have expectations all the time in all the important areas of our life. Do you expect your work supervisor to recognize your work more? Do you expect your landlord to call you back within a week? Do you expect your government to represent the demographics of your city, state, or country? Are these reasonable or unreasonable expectations, and what context would change that? Learning the line between reasonable and unreasonable expectations has been an essential part of my own mental health development over the course of my adult life. As important as it is for us to be aware of our unreasonable expectations and let go of them, it's equally important of us to be aware of our reasonable expectations and hold on to them. We can expect to be treated with respect and dignity. We can expect the acceptance of our loved ones. And we can expect universal health care. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to throw that in there. And I'm not saying that we can create our own realities by controlling our expectations, because I think that's overly simplistic and a little needlessly optimistic. What I am saying is that it benefits us to understand our expectations because we can to some extent affect them through conscious attention. Not to manifest whatever it is we wish from the world, since that's simply exerting some expectations on a perhaps unwilling world, but when we pay attention to our expectations, a funny thing happens. We learn something about ourselves. Our awareness of the existence of our expectations provokes a host of questions, a menu of who, what, where, when, whys, and now maybe we get to therapy. Expectations in therapy are very complicated, and as a therapist I find myself to be meeting completely different expectations from one hour to the next. People going to a therapist can have literally any motivation to do so. There's no bad reason to start talking to someone. I'll have someone expect me to be engaging and social, and then the next person expect me to totally take a back seat, which I completely understand, 
And then the next one after that might expect me to fix a problem. And these are all totally fine. Even if an expectation isn't totally realistic, I'm still comfortable handling the feelings that come up for me from someone expecting, for example, that I can fix a problem single-handedly or something like that. I get it. I mean, it's not that unreasonable. And in, in some cases, I can help fix a problem just by suggesting some kind of cool strategy for dealing with stress or, you know, even just helping someone talk through something and find the solution themselves. Sometimes you don't know if you can meet an expectation until you try. So depending on the context surrounding each instance, a given expectation may be reasonable, unreasonable, or somewhere in between. I used to watch these talks on YouTube by this monk, Ajahn Brahm, from the Buddhist Society of Western Australia. And I remember one time he said that suffering is when we expect from the world what it can't provide us. And I thought that was a really concise and well put way to explain it. So I try to check myself regularly about my expectations, and I also try to check the situations I'm in to understand what expectations do other people have of me, and do I accept that or not? Because you don't have to take on other people's expectations if you don't find them reasonable. A big part of mental health is reasonable expectations of the world, of other people, and maybe most importantly, of ourselves. Do you expect to be thrilled and happy all the time? Hopefully not but it doesn't mean it isn't worth trying. Who gets to decide where the line between reasonable and unreasonable expectations even is? You could always try to have no expectations, but I would argue that you're probably doing that because you expect it to be beneficial. Well, it might be. All right, thanks for watching.